welcome to the Raising Kellen podcast. My name is Marsh Naidu and I am a physical therapist as well as parent raising my son Kellen, a 10-year-old boy with cerebral palsy. I blog at raisingkellen.org where we curate resources to empower and educate parents raising children with disabilities. This digital platform is a free resource and part of a 501c3 nonprofit registered in the state of Tennessee. If you are a business or individual interested in supporting our mission, hop over to the website raisingkellen.org where you can see what sponsorship looks like. This year, we look to investigate the infrastructure that is in place to help support adults with disabilities, such as housing, transportation, education, employment, as well as medical care. In today's episode of the podcast, we are joined by Jeff Strand, Coordinator of Government and External Affairs at the Tennessee Disability Coalition. Jeff will be informing us as to the priority policies for this upcoming year at the Tennessee General Assembly. As always, remember the information provided on this podcast is purely educational. And if you are seeking advice for your specific situation, to always contact a trained professional. Hi guys, today I'm here with Jeff Strand from the Tennessee Disability Coalition. Uh, Just as a reminder, our friends at the coalition actually form part of an organization or rather a alliance of member organizations as well as individuals. So you don't need to belong to a, a profit or non-profit organization. You could just be a ordinary citizen that's vested in what happens uh, in our community. And that is a, a community that primarily serves persons of disabilities as well as their families. Welcome, Jeff, once again to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Well, it is a busy time, Jeff. Tell us what is happening and what bills are priority this year. Before we, we head into that, Jeff, just a little bit of background as far as how things get put into motion for a bill to be proposed uh, to the House of Representatives at the Assembly. Yeah, uh, no problem. So I think that um, the the inner workings of the General Assembly really start at the end of summer and the beginning of fall. And that's when legislators and community constituents, uh, people with good ideas, are coming forward with their ideas for legislation or ways that they think that their communities could be better, the state could be better. And they're starting to share those things, you know, doing research on that kind of thing, finding allies. Um, looking at the Tennessee code to see what it already says, checking out rules, that kind of thing. So really the the idea is the beginning part of it. Uh, and then when the formal stuff starts to begin, that's the beginning of January. So I think it's it's like two weeks ago now, two weeks and a couple of days, uh, the General Assembly kicked off the first year of a two-year session. So each General Assembly session is two years. Um, this, Like I said, this is the first year. That means that on that very first kickoff day, they all, you know, put on their suit jackets and go sit in the in general assembly chambers and say their oaths and and do all sorts of formalities right um and then they vote on committee assignments uh the speakers assign uh the general assembly members to committees that'll talk about things like insurance or health care or education committees for a lot of different legislative topics uh and then I think it's funny to see all of this happen down at Cordell Hall the legislative office building it's moving week uh, so last week was moving week. They, When you get a new committee assignment or there are new members of the General Assembly, you have to kind of shuffle around offices to make sure everybody has the appropriately sized uh, office or appropriately located office. Um, and that was last week. Okay. So this week, they're really starting to kind of move forward with things. Uh, they have what's called the consent calendar this week. Uh, that's uh, pieces of legislation that are very non-controversial, um, like 
extending the Department of Health, like things that we're going to do no matter what, it doesn't matter. So they all say yay, and, and that goes. Um, so during this whole time, while they're moving, while they're patting each other on the back, they're submitting legislation. So they're submitting bills. And each bill for it to move forward needs a House sponsor and a Senate sponsor. So it doesn't have to be the exact same bill, but they have to be uh, they have to be very close. Uh, and they'll take their two separate tracks through the House and the Senate. So once you've got a House and Senate sponsor, it's submitted. And you bring it to uh, it's the clerk's desk. And the clerk has, I'm, I'm not sure, like a fancy stamp uh, and then sends it over to the speakers who then will put it on a calendar. Um, and so once it's submitted, clerk stamps it, put on a calendar, that's when it can start to be held in these committees, right? So an education committee or a healthcare committee, depending on what it's about. And some bills like the public school funding formula last year uh, went through seven on one side and eight committees on the other side. Others will go through one, two, three is probably more common. Um, so people will be submitting their bills all the way up until bill filing deadline. So this year in the House, that's January 31st. So it's coming up really fast. Okay. Uh, and in the Senate, it is February 2nd. Uh, so after that point, nobody's allowed to uh, submit new legislation. There is one kind of workaround for this one. It's called a caption bill, which means that somebody has an idea, but they're not quite sure of the language or the text or what exactly the bill is going to say, but they know what they want it to do. So they find themselves a House and Senate sponsor and they write a caption, which means it's just opening up part of the code for an amendment. So, for example, um, uh, Title 49 of the code is education. So if you wanted to do something about education, you'd say your caption would be, I'm opening up Title 49, right? So those uh, are a little bit different than the bill filing deadline. There'll be no new bills after that, but we won't know everything right away. But we'll know the extent, the number of bills that are on the table. And I would expect 1,200 or 1,300 um, but in each of the House and Senate. So there's a lot of bills to sift through. There's already 500 plus right now. And I'd expect as we get close to the deadline here, quite a few more coming through. So once you're in these committees, they will debate, talk about it. They'll bring in people for testimony. They'll submit amendments. So if they like, I really like this bill, but if we did this tiny thing different, I could really support it. So they would do amendments like that. And then each committee will vote to either, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, kill the bill uh, if they don't think it should move forward out of their committee or suggest that it moves on to the next committee. So it could be um, the K-12 subcommittee is the very first education committee you'd go to. They might vote that you go all the you know next to the House Education Committee. So they'll vote to go to the next one. Uh, and then vote to committee, to committee, to committee. They'll debate, amend, debate, amend in each of those. And then it'll finally go to uh, the Senate and House floor. Um, once it's gotten to this point, um, especially with the makeup of our General Assembly, uh, with the supermajority, um, it's unlikely that it'll change or any surprises happen on the floor. Um, usually that stuff all gets hammered out in committee. Um, they'll get in their fancier chambers, the House and Senate uh, at the Capitol, and they'll vote on it. Uh, if it passes, each of the speakers sign it. So the Speaker of the Senate leads the Senate, Speaker of the House leads the House. They'll sign it, send it to the governor, who's got 10 days to either sign it into law, veto it, and send it back to the General Assembly to vote on again or change um, if, if they so choose. Or he can just not do anything and it becomes law automatically in 10 days. So if a parent or an individual was interested or had an idea, they would put this idea forth to their representative of their district? That, I think, and that's just a personal opinion, is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, your elected officials who are elected to represent you mm -hmm. are beholden to you. That, that's their job is to make sure that you and the people in your community uh, have a voice. Um, and so it makes sense to go to those folks. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are other opportunities. You can come to organizations like ours. Um, we submit bills. We've submitted three bills this year. Um, and then we'll bring those to say important people on committees. So if we have an education bill, we might go looking for a sponsor who's on an education committee. Wow. Thank you for explaining that, Jeff. Uh, what are the priority bills that um, that's on the table, so to speak, for the Tennessee Disability Coalition? Yeah. So 
like I mentioned before, we have three that we are actually submitting this year. And I'm pretty excited because I've never submitted bills on my own before. I've been more kind of a watcher and supporter type of type of position. Um, but I'll, I'll go through those first three really quick. Got a couple more that I like and then two that I'll tell you about that I don't like. Um, so the first one that we're working on that we're really excited about and really optimistic about uh, is around ABLE accounts. And ABLE accounts are tax advantaged accounts for young people with disabilities that allow them to save money without jeopardizing access to their benefits. Typically, if you're receiving uh, support from the state or federal government, you can only have $2,000 in assets or in your bank account at a given time. Uh, the An ABLE account would allow you to save money in this kind of different savings account, and that doesn't count towards your benefits. So it allows someone to go and work and save their money or save up to buy a car or save up to move or, or, or really just promote independence, have money of your own um, without, you know, potentially jeopardizing your health care. Um, the one drawback of an ABLE account is that it's subject to a state recovery. So that means that when the beneficiary or the person who has the account passes away, the state is allowed to go into that account, that ABLE account and uh, reimburse themselves for any healthcare or services that were provided over your lifetime. Um, so usually those are expensive services and that clears out an account. And people hesitate then because you can save up to $100,000 in those accounts um, over someone's lifetime. And that could all be wiped away for something that, you know, we weren't expected to pay for in the first place. Um, you know, the services and healthcare provided by the state they're not generosity. They're not charity. They're not something to be paid back. It's not a loan. It's what we as a society have agreed that we would provide for people who need it. Um, <clears throat> so all that is to say what this bill does is it prohibits the state from uh, engaging in that estate recovery. So trying to take that money uh, besides what the federal government requires them to do. So our hope is that it encourages more people who might be on the fence about an ABLE account to say, okay, that one thing is out of the way. Now we can start saving money for a Handsome. car house. I can go get a job. Yeah. So Jeff, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding that it is actually federal law that money cannot be recovered from these ABLE accounts. However, the individual state either has options to opt in or opt out. And Tennessee had was obviously opted out. From, That's right. Okay. Yeah. So the the two rules from the federal government are that any services provided after the age of 55 are required to be subject to a state recovery. So if if you know if you got health care from the state after the age of 55, then the state is required by uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to go after that money. Um, and then the other is that the federal government gives states the option. And you're right, it's an opt-in, opt-out. Um, the default is an opt-in that we're going to engage in a state recovery. Uh, and Tennessee, should we pass this bill, would be the 10th state to opt out of trying to access that money for people under the age of 55. I just want to say this, and this is by, by the by, I think... Um, it pretty much ties into the fact that Tennessee is trying to um, really work towards making it the state for persons of disabilities to, to move ahead. And uh, this year's um, logo for the uh, Tennessee Disability uh, Coalition is My Tennessee Life. And I think that that very aptly ties in with that. So... Jeff, what else is on the table, sir? Yeah, so here's another one I'm excited about because this one came to us from a constituent. So somebody who personally experienced this issue came to us with an idea and said, we should try to fix this. So that's why I'm, I'm really excited about this one. And this one is a two-part bill um, where we're only going to get to one part this year. So the whole thing, the way that I've been writing it out is called the right to repair. And this year's is right to repair number one. Um, so what this one would do this year is would eliminate the necessity or the requirement for a prior authorization, uh, from your insurance company 
to receive repairs on your wheelchair, whether that be a power or a manual wheelchair. Currently, um, it can take a really long time to get your wheelchair fixed. That's what our, uh, you know, our friend came to us to say was that she had been, you know, held up for six weeks trying to get a battery replaced on her wheelchair, uh, which meant she couldn't go to work. She couldn't go into the community. She couldn't leave her house. She was nearly bedridden because she was dependent on her power wheelchair for that mobility. Uh, and it took so long in part because of the necessity of a prior authorization. People, especially who are in power wheelchairs, are typically going to be uh, in a power wheelchair yes. for the long term, right? Um, you know, not everybody, but typically that's how it goes. Um, and if you've already established the medical necessity that a doctor wrote you a prescription for a power wheelchair, I don't understand why you would have to get that medical necessity reaffirmed to get that same power wheelchair they already approved fixed. So what this would do is it would eliminate um, or it would prohibit insurance companies and TenCare, the state Medicaid uh, agency, from requiring prior authorization for the repair of a wheelchair. Uh, and it's our hope that this uh, speeds up the process um, and and really benefits people who use a wheelchair. So those are the two priority bills as of right now. Uh, another one we're working with some partners on is expanding the prohibition on corporal punishment in schools. So that's using a paddle or some other object to punish a student in a physical way. Um, currently, students with disabilities are protected from that, except if their parent opts them in. We are trying to add a few more layers of protection uh, for these students and for students who might not have been evaluated or identified as having a disability yet. Uh, that's especially really young kids. Yeah, so we're excited about that one. Um, there are like four bills proposed this year and some interest from the governor. He's, you know, expressed wanting to get into this field is a uh, paid family leave in the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are, uh, you know, nearly half the states, especially for their state employees, offer paid family leave for uh, dealing with an illness yourself, uh, having a child, dealing with a family member's illness or death or something like that. Tennessee does not have that. They have unpaid leave, but that's not as helpful. Um, they're like, like I mentioned, four, I think at this point, paid family leave options on the table. Um, and the governor, like I mentioned before, has expressed willingness to engage in this area. And then the last one I think is really interesting for advocates uh, is it would require the state to archive the General Assembly website. So the General Assembly website is a wealth of information. You can find what's going to happen next on a bill. You can read the bill text. You can see amendments. You can watch videos all from that spot. You can find your legislator legislatures. Um, <clears throat> it's really a helpful website. The only problem is that every year it gets wiped clean and then you can't see anything from the previous year. So uh, if it's like this year, it's the first year of a session and you're trying to see, oh, I know that bill passed last year, but it's related to my interest. You can't go back and look at it because it's been wiped clean. So this would require them to archive the General Assembly website, which would be a huge boon to advocates like us. There are two more that I don't like as much. Um one I'm referring to as the me mechanical restraint bill. Uh, mechanical restraint is using like handcuffs or zip ties. Um, and what who this affects are students with disabilities in schools. So currently, and as a result of a 2018, so before me, TDC effort, uh, Tennessee has some really strict restraint and se seclusion laws that really protect kids with disabilities from being restrained by adults. Uh, from being locked into rooms by themselves, that kind of thing that have no academic benefit, nor any really behavioral social benefit. Um, what this one, what this bill would do is it would roll some of those protections back and allow student resource officers or police officers uh, to use mechanical restraints, so uh, handcuffs or zip ties, in an emergency situation. So it's extra vague. There's really no reason we should be handcuffing kids there's no benefit to this. You can already use these as a police officer um, as part of your, you know, your job. I, it, I, we're not sure why this bill exists, and um, we really don't want to roll those protections back for kids with disabilities or any kids for that matter. Yes, sir. And then there's one more, and this is a big one this year. Everybody's talking about it. There are like 10 
uh, bills submitted in this area. It's the problem of third grade retention. So uh, in 2021, the General Assembly passed a big school bill meant to kind of address the effects of the pandemic and kids being out of school. One of those was to set up these summer camps, summer learning camps and bridge camps right before school starts. Uh, and then another big component of this was to be set to come into effect this year would be that third grade students who do not read on uh, proficiently. So when they take that one test in the spring, if they don't score proficient, they are subject to be to be being held back. Um, and that would create an enormous cohort of third graders, given that our state is pretty dismal in our reading and math proficiency rates. Um, so it, it really takes the uh, uh, you know power out of the hands of parents to decide what's going to be best for their kids. Uh, it's a logistical nightmare for schools. There's very little evidence that retention is beneficial over the long term. Uh, it can work for some kids, but uh, the, the evidence shows that for most kids, it's not going to work very well. And it's just it's it doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of ways that General Assembly members are trying to fix that this year. We have an exciting event coming back on the roster, and that's the uh, Tennessee Disability Day on the Hill. Would you uh, kindly speak more to that, Jeff? Yes. And I, I know I've been excited all morning, but I'm, a, I'm really <laughs> excited about Disability Day on the Hill this year because it is back in person. And I have never had the privilege of being part of an in-person DDH. Um, so we've got, uh, what is this, F four events. Um leading up to and including DDH. Um, so the very first event is the webinar. Uh, so we're going to have a legislative webinar. We're going to invite some people who are sponsoring our bills uh, and some and some other important bills to come and chat with um, our community. So that is March uh, 2nd. Um, and then March 7th, we're having a big party. We're calling it our community party. We're inviting anybody and everybody who's coming down to come have some heavy apps, maybe a couple drinks, talk with um, the other members of the community that you haven't seen for three years and and really just have that time together as a community uh, to really just get ourselves ready for the big day, which is March 8th. Disability Day on the Hill this year is March 8th. We are bringing everybody that we possibly can down to Cordell Hall, the legislative office building, the Capitol. We are going to clog up their hallways. We are going to fill up their offices uh, we're inviting a bunch of our partners to come in and set up tables down in the lunch area. Um, it's going to be really exciting. I'm going to do some Facebook Live uh, from Disability Day on the Hill. So if you can't make it, I'm going to put it in my pocket, <laughs> my phone in my pocket, and you'll get first-person view of what DDH looks like. Um, it, it's going to be a really fun time. Uh, and then last, kind of as a big celebration at the end to say, look at all we've done. Uh, this year, look at all we've done in the past. Look at all we're going to do in the future. Disability Advocacy Day is March 11th. Uh, and that's when uh, Tom, our uh, brilliant comms person, yes, uh, reaches yes. out to literally everybody in the state who owns a building and asks if they'll light it up blue to celebrate disability advocates and all the the great work that they've done. Uh, so I'm really excited about this year. And I, and I encourage anybody and everybody to come on down and join us. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, to know more about Tennessee Disability Day on the Hill uh, and the upcoming events, um, we could refer to the website as well as um, on social media, guys. Uh, Jeff, I believe it's hashtag My Tennessee Life. That That's is right, the man. logo for this year's uh, Day on the Hill. Um, so guys taking your pictures and posting on social media with that hashtag will also draw the community closer together for that common purpose. Um, uh, is there anything, uh, obviously, Jeff, I would, uh, please come on back at the end of the session. I know you, no one really knows when the end of the session would be, you say possibly April or May. Uh, to kind of let us know what has transpired and what has actually taken place as far as these bills are concerned. Um, and the other thing as well, what I found particularly helpful um, 
other weekly updates we receive from the um, from the coalition written by Jeff to let us where you put us on a timeline and let us know exactly what's happening every week. And how can we sign up for that newsletter, um, Jeff, for those guys that might be interested in following along? Yeah, absolutely. So um, all you have to do is just send me an email. My email is jeff underscore s at tndisability.org. Um, and I will put you on my list. Looking forward to seeing you on Disability Day on the Hill. I'm keeping fingers crossed. Yes. Thank you for having me. Uh, I hope to see everybody. Uh, like Mark said, please head on over to our website, tndisability.org and RSVP by February 25th. I hope to see you all and I look forward to recapping at the end of this uh, at the end of the session. Sounds good, Jeff. You have an amazing day, okay? Thanks, you too. Thank you so much for listening along to us today. And Jeff, we appreciate you kindly informing us as well as to the policies that are on the table for this upcoming uh, General Assembly. Tennessee Disability Day on the Hill is slated to happen on March the 8th. If you are not unable to join in person, you can always participate by joining the virtual events as well as hashtagging your photographs on social media with My Tennessee Life. And another way to participate as well is joining the Facebook group Tennessee Disability Advocates Group. Again, the reference for the website to check on uh, the upcoming events is TN Disability. Dot org. As always, guys, remember, get to the top of your mountain. This is Marsh Naidu signing off.